Hey y'all, in this video it's going to be a look back at the 1990s formation of Image Comics and thoughts about it from a fan perspective growing up then because for a while they were the hottest property in all of the comic book industry for a few years. They were the most innovative and in-demand product going. Before we get there, we have to look back at the late 1980s, early 1990s, when three artists in particular of Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, and Jim Lee were the hottest creators in the industry. They were selling books in the millions of copies. Regular issues were over 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. Who knows, right? And it could be argued that even though they were not the first superstars in the industry, for our generation of readers and the generation that grew up then, they were the superstars of the industry for them. And I don't think it's been almost, what, 30 years later? There's never been anything quite like them in the industry. There's been a few, but never at that level. And the proof could be found in who are the industries and who are the people in the past 20 plus years who are selling 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 copies an issue. Nobody, nobody in, the, nobody in the industry today is selling that. Because when these guys were hot and in demand, it was like the best thing going. Because first, we have to step back a little before talking about Image. You had Spider-Man by Todd McFarlane. You had Jim Lee on the X-Men. And you had Rob Liefeld on the New Mutants and then X-Force with Cable, Deadpool, and all of them that he created. And I mean, Marvel was selling over a million copies on first issue reboots. They were promoting these guys and they were the best thing going. In fact, you'd have to wonder why even leave Marvel because their royalty rates per issue were a lot. I mean, it was like incredible how much they were making every month from the royalty rates uh, of the copies sold. Incredible amount. So you'd think, you know, why go out on your own and why stop when you're on a hot streak, you know? So eventually, McFarlane, he wanted to stop, so he left Marvel, editorial issues, whatever. Liefeld got tired of giving away his best characters, you know? And I guess Jim Lee, they got him on board a little reluctantly overall. And I guess Marvel never expected that their top people would leave and form their own company. Cause that's never happened before, you know? That guys they promoted to the top would suddenly leave and then Marvel for a while tried to ignore it and pretend it didn't matter. But and they held on for a bit, but it really did matter because once they left the books, Marvel's quality really suffered for quite a bit. So switching it up now and talking about thoughts about early image, Wizard Magazine was a huge promoter of them. They had that group shot of the seven image creators and they were promoting their creative ideas and the covers of the Wizard Magazine. And it was building up hype from a fan perspective. It was building up hype on, since we know who the creators were, who were these characters, what books are they making, etc. And they were making a shared universe, for one thing, where they'd cross over. But they would also own their own properties. So, they would individually own their own books. And here's my thoughts about the issues, the books, and the characters back then as a fan, okay? The first image book officially was Young Blood number one. When the promoting of this Young Blood, you had Shaft, Die Hard, Chapel, Bedrock, and the other characters on that issue, that cover, which is being promoted, right? 
And I remember, you know, the hype was there. When, as a fan, you got that first issue, it was weird and then sort of disappointing because here is why. It was a flip book and they had another team of Young Blood on the back cover that was not really advertised, that really had no promotion. And so the team that, as a fan, we were getting used to and being marketed to, this was a whole other team on the other side of the book. And here's the weird thing. The main story with the Young Blood members that we knew from the promotions with Shaft and company, the story was starting out and then you have Shaft in the main role, these bad guys break out, the Young Blood team is going to confront them, a fight is just about starting, and then the book cuts off. Just when the action, just when the fight is starting, the book, it just ends, okay? And then the flip book has Team Youngblood, the other team that really didn't have any marketing behind it, and were like, who are these characters? They go to like, basically, without saying it, they use like fake names, like a Kuwait, and they kill Saddam Hussein type of character, okay? But here's the thing, they weren't supposed to kill the guy, and then one member on the team who has psychic powers is like a loose cannon, and then he doesn't obey orders, and then he goes berserk, okay? So you think, okay, and so they have to do a cover-up story of what happened unofficially, so they lie to the news media. So you think there's potential there, right? And when you look back, here is where two factors, okay, I should suppose to say. Issue two of Youngblood, you think you'd follow the battle between Shaft, Chapel, Die Hard, Bad Rock and company versus these bad guys who escaped, right? Because, as I said, issue one ends, the battle's about to start, it's really getting intense, and it just cuts off. Issue two, no continuation of the battle. Issue two, totally different topic. No decisive conclusion or emotional connection or, or story ending to the first issue of Young Blood that was advertised with those cover stars and it just totally switched topics and that was weird. That was, it was just bad storytelling, okay? And, and you'd think this Team Young Blood, with I said with the psychic guy, I think his name was Link, you would think there would be potential there, right? You could build on it. You have this loose cannon, he doesn't obey government orders, he has psychic powers, he's very dangerous. And you would think, you know, you could build this guy up as a bad guy. You could build him up as the interesting character, the character that you can't predict what's going to happen with this guy. No real follow through. They never, they never reached that potential. They didn't follow that storyline. They didn't build it up. They really squandered that chance to potentially build this guy up. He disobeyed orders in the first issue and then totally went on his own and loose cannon. And you could have built on that. You could have made this guy a future bad guy for the team or just a guy that's hard to control. And no, no story depth, no follow up on that. And so I want to say that about the first issue and the second issue of Young Blood. So my thoughts on it, that it didn't follow up the story, it didn't follow up the... It was just weird, you know? And it would have been one thing if the first issue, the second part of the Young Blood, wasn't done by the same artist. But it was, because then you could have just finished the first story and the story advertised. It was building up too much, too soon, and not a proper payoff. That was just my thoughts on it as a fan. And I still like the Young Blood characters. The core members, I think, are really have potential. Really have, could be good. But, and they've had all the reboots after. But nothing has quite lived up to that early 1990s issues, that early 1990s hype, and fan interest in the community. Second book, I think, by Image was Todd McFarlane's Spawn, and this was being advertised in Wizard. He had that cover issue when he was showing the character and an interview. Plus he has a little bit of that Spider-Man feel to it. And so this sold over a million copies as well. I think it was like an independent record, like 1.5 million. 
And this was better because you had McFarlane, he did everything, the writing, the art. More of a complete feel for a story. And it wasn't bad. You find out this guy, he was killed and then he was made a deal with a devil, he was brought back and he has these strange powers and you really got a sort of the mystery of who killed him, how did all this happen and it was pretty interesting. It was pretty much for the first two years McFarlane was doing the art and then he handed off the art and just did the writing and it just wasn't as good to me after the first two years or so. It was definitely a solid book. The character is still around. And overall, it was pretty solid work. So this was a pretty good book overall. The third big name and issue was Wildcats by Jim Lee. And it was a team book. But to me, Wildcats, again, as fans, we were buying these books because of the creators on the books and their art styles. We weren't buying them really because of who the characters were, we were buying it because these creators could have made any book, any character, any title, and we fans would have probably bought the same amount of issues anyway. Wildcats to me was a weird cookie because it never quite clicked at a foundational level. Probably because to me the X-Men was such a hot property and when you go to that X-Men level stuff to characters who feel like it's a grade B level team or a grade C level. It's just weird because you went from X-Men, super amazing stuff, to almost a copy of it. You know, and it just, it was a bit too close of an association. It would have probably been better to go on a solo title instead of another team book. And I think visually, the Wildcats just weren't as interesting character-wise as the X-Men. The only one with real potential was Grifter. He was the only Wildcat that was really the best member of the team. And the rest were not even close to him in terms of being characters. Then we get to the fourth book, is Savage Dragon by Eric Lawson. He was the one who took over after McFarlane in the Spider-Man comics. And so he was a pretty hot artist back then. And the Savage Dragon was his own creation. A green-skinned guy with a fin on his head. And it was a pretty solid book. And it's the book still going today. With the guy doing the art, the writing. So it was a solid start. Probably the most reliable was that and Spawn. After that was Mark Silvestri. He was a popular artist on the X-Men before Jim Lee. Just a solid style, good, good artist overall. And his cyber force was basically, not mutants, but humans with technology mesh, cyborgs type of thing. And the bad guys were like cyborgs, the good guys were like cyborgs. Which kind of, it didn't really have that good fit to it. Because, again, going from X-Men level property to to this property was kinda like you can't compare X-Men to a new property like that because the X-Men is so much better in that established Marvel world that Cyberforce they always had restarts again but never quite as hot as that early 1990s stuff you know but that was an interesting book it just never reached that super high levels I thought that it could have had after that we have probably the oddball of the group was Jim Valentino and Shadowhawk was a solo vigilante hero he created. The problem with Shadowhawk was actually Jim Valentino was never at that level as a McFarlane, a Jim Lee, a Mark Silvestri. He was never at that level of being what you would consider a top mover and shaker in the industry. His best work then was Guardians of the Galaxy, the 1990s version, that, and I bought that run. It was a good, solid run, but it wasn't, and he wasn't, at the level of million dollar seller. You know, it's like, there's always, I guess you look at someone, you go, why did that person make it into the group? You know, the, the odd fit, and he was the one. 
he was probably the best writer, ironically, but you couldn't say he was the best artist in terms of that fan level mover or shaker of the industry. And I remember his first issue was a preview on a flip book of Youngblood. I think it was issue two. So it was a nice way to tease a new character just like that. And then I bought the regular Shadowhawk series. And the last creator, and I put him last for a reason, was Wills Potassio. And he had this advertised on Wizard, What Works Team, which is a bunch of, it was a team group that had gold armor as skin. And it just visually looked good. And what happened was Wildcats issue two had a flip story, only a couple of pages, where they showed What Works in action with one of the members. And he thought it was really cool. But this was what happened. Because of family issues and personal reasons, the book was never published for like two years or so. And so by the time the book was published, What Works, and you had that fan hype, and it's been so long that the fan interest wasn't there. That level of hype from the image books, it, it had faded by then, by the time it was out. Part of the reason it faded was the image books, after the first few issues, were on massive delays. And it really hurt them, it really hurt the industry that books advertised didn't show up for months. And that was unfortunate. And that, it just really hurt a lot of the properties also. It hurt a lot of the momentum for the company. And, uh... Also, I think by the mid-90s, with Marvel going bankrupt and the industry just going on hard times, that the high point that they were all going to, the industry just crashed down and everyone got affected. And that really affected Marvel, that really affected Image Comics, as well as the fan base leaving and moving on. And so, there was a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, I should mention one other thing, though. One other creator, even though he wasn't a founding member of the Seven, Dale Keown, best known for the Hulk in the 1990s, he made a character called Pit, which was like a big, similar Hulkish character. Pit was another book that had a good first issue or two, and then massive delays, massive uh, no follow up for a long time. And it really hurt, you know, because this character looked interesting, it had the hype. And he was a real hot creator back then. And so he was carrying that fame from Marvel to Image. And that was a book that also had a lot of potential. And it, and it had started up during that hot streak of Image. So anyway, back to Image. I think the mid-90s, the downfall of the comics industry. And there were many factors in it. But I don't think personally Image, who was so hot, in terms of that level, they were never, as an industry, never a mover and shaker again. Never at that level again. Either with fans, the books were never as hot, and it just, it changed, you know. It was also reasons of ego, from what I was reading years later, that they were all competing with each other, and, you know, young artists and having egos and stuff. Now, had they worked together and just built a strong, solid foundation, I think they would be the third biggest comic industry company. Had they just had that unity to stick around and work together and not just work solo, really out for yourself only. I view it mostly as a missed opportunity because... They had the audience, they had the power, and they were taking it away from Marvel and DC. And they were in the spotlight shining for a few short years. And they could have built on that foundation, they could have taken it to the next level and been really just a solid company. But it didn't happen, you know, when you look back on it. And so I think it was a missed opportunity in many ways. But for fans back then, it was a few short years of just possibility and amazing stuff that is still fondly looked back on.
days of comic books and collecting if you were a fan back then. And I guess the biggest legacy is it gave creators rights to own your property. You see, it had happened, creator rights that you could own your own books, even before Image Comics formed. But Image Comics, when it formed, it took it to a level that it never really had before in terms of the industry, in terms of individual creators, that it really brought it to a new level, the possibility that you could actually own your own properties and get popular with the fan base and build it up instead of giving your stuff that's precious to Marvel or DC. You now have a third option of owning what you make and being the boss of your own company. And that is probably the biggest legacy, you know, that has benefited creators today is that freedom and that possibility of being a creator. And without Image, it's doubtful that this level of freedom to own your own stuff would exist at that level. It probably wouldn't, you know. And the best thing that creators do now, or could do, is work at Marvel and DC, build up your reputation, but don't give them your characters, don't give them your fresh new ideas. And then take that stuff out and experiment, make your own books, whether it be Image or other companies, to self-publish, to own your stuff, and then probably get your audience, follow it with you, cut Hollywood deals, cut movie, toy, video game deals, and you can make a good living that way on properties that you own. At least you have that opportunity now. And so that's just look back talk, a little rambling all over the place. Let me know what you think, and talk to you later.